Thank you so much, Eddie. It's nice to be here. I'm, I'm pleased to be your first session today. I'm going to do an introduction um, to the common alerting protocol. So it'll be um, for those of you who have very little familiar familiarity with the common alerting protocol, this will be um, a brief introduction. It's there is a lot of complexity that we might have a chance to go into later on in the breakout rooms later on in this in this workshop. But this will be a, a brief inter introduction to CAP and we'll talk about um, sort of why um, why there's a need for a protocol relating to emergency alerting and how it can be beneficial and how it is beneficial um, to, to help to support the distribution of alerts to the communities that really need it. Um, we're going to begin with, uh, we're going to begin with a couple of questions that'll help set the stage for this session. Um, so we're going to use a menti. Um, I think we have two questions that'll come up um, for you to, to join the mentee. So either on your, uh, on your computer or on your phone, if you can go in and go to menti.com and use this code. Exactly. Or you can click on the link in the chat, um, but please go ahead and go to menti.com um, through one of those, through one of those ways. And, and just answer this question. How do you personally um, currently receive alerts, emergency alerts in, um, that, that, that affect your area, that affect your community? And we'll give it a, a couple of minutes or give it a minute here to allow everyone a moment to, to respond. Interesting, great. Well, some really interesting, some really interesting responses so far. Some that we expect, of course. Social media is a big one. Text messages are a big one. I see a couple of different examples of, of mobile phone applications. Things like TV, news radio. Great. Excel broadcast. Android alerts. Mm -hmm. Some specific call outs for things like WhatsApp and Twitter. And interestingly enough, and this is one that we'll definitely, you know, hopefully be able to help with today is the response of I don't receive alerts. So that's something that we'll definitely have a chance to, to talk about today. Great, these are great responses. Also some local things like, like churches, word of mouth. Very interesting. Thank you so much. I think that's, that's great. I think this gives us a good idea of sort of the, the current state of, of receiving of emergency alerts. There are a lot of these in here that I would agree with also. I, get, I have official, um, the, you know, a weather app, um, also sell broadcast and social media. So let's go on to the next question. And so with this, um, with this in mind, you know, thinking about how you currently receive emergency alerts, uh, the next question to think about is, you know, when you when you think about emergency alerting in your community and in your country, what are some of the biggest challenges that you see um, that um, that you know, hopefully we might be able to answer some some of those today. But think about what are the biggest challenges for alerting, whether um, at all different levels. And we'll see. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, absolutely. Delays in and a couple of things about the messages not being timely enough to be useful. Um, some things about messages being confusing. 
um, alerts not necessarily reaching people who really need them, either because of mobile connection issues, um, other other communication channels, maybe people, that's a good one, maybe people, awareness of systems, maybe people aren't really aware of where they can get that information. Accuracy. Yeah, these are some really great responses. I see a lot of themes raising. Terminology used is too technical. Yeah, absolutely, which can also contribute, I guess, here to misinformation or misinterpretation. Highly technical terms. Translating early warning information into anticipatory action, accuracy, information not easily understood. That's great. Some alerting authorities don't use the CAP format. <laughs> These are wonderful responses. Oh my goodness. They just keep going. This is great. Limited connectivity, delays, languages, things come up again. Wonderful. Okay, these are some really great responses. Um, thank you so much for answering both of these questions. I think I think that kind of sets the stage for this conversation. Um, so I'm gonna, um, I'm going to move into my presentation and we're going to start talking about the common alerting protocol, which will sort of address both of these questions that we've started with. It'll, you know, think about the ways that people receive messages, what kind of information is contained in those messages, and um, addressing some of these challenges that you've mentioned. So I'm going to share my screen here. There, can you see that all right? Excellent. Yes, we do. Great. Thank you. All right. So this will be, as I said, a brief introduction to CAP. Um, I'll also share with you um, later on and in the chat, we'll share some links where you can find additional information to follow up and, and we'll have an opportunity later on for Q&A. But briefly, we're going to go through um, this, this little agenda. So we'll address the key information that's necessary um, in an emergency. Um, the, some of the challenges, which you've very kindly uh, shared a lot of the challenges that you, um, that you experience, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we'll really talk about what CAP is and what the benefits are and how CAP messages work, and, and ultimately how that means that we can get these really important emergency alert messages to the public. So we'll start with some key information, you know, and this is based on um, you know, some of the things that you mentioned. So think about a particular scenario. Um, I think most of us um, can probably, um, you know, can probably understand the threat of a flash flood that might be impending. Um, it's a very common emergency that a lot of us face regardless of where we live. So if lives are at stake um, and people need to know what's going on so that they can help to prevent loss of life and loss of property, they need to know some really key information and it needs to be clear. Um, so they need to know what exactly is going on. What is the emergency? What area is affected? Is this going to impact me? Is it going to impact, um, you know, another, another area of my community? How soon is it coming? Is it going to be coming, you know, tomorrow or is the flash flood happening now and I need to do something immediately? How bad will it be? Is this sort of a normal everyday flood? Um, here in, I live in New Orleans in the U.S., which is a city that is in a bowl, which is underwater. We experience floods almost every time it rains. There's localized street flooding. So is it our normal sort of weekly localized street flooding, or is it a, a, a much bigger threat that we need to be differently prepared for? Um, how certain are we that it's happening? What are the sort of what are the odds, I guess, of whether or not it's happening? And, and then what do we do? Um, in the face of all of this other information, what are we supposed to do? What are the actionable actions that we can take to help to, to protect our lives and our loved ones and our property? So these are all the key facts that we need to think about when it comes to an emergency and the key things that need to be shared with the community. So with that in mind, with that kind of scenario in mind, that'll sort of um, lead us into the rest of this communication. So we 
we've talked a lot about, or we've already looked at your, your responses to what the main issues are regarding public alerting in your country. And a lot of these will, we, we see a lot of opportunities to improve this situation and CAP can absolutely address a lot of them. So some of these things we've already talked about. So in, in many countries, most governments have multiple public alerting systems. A lot of those are hazard specific. So you might have a hydromet office that issues your, your weather alerts and your flood alerts, you know, thunderstorms, tornadoes, those sorts of things. You might have a geological um, agency that issues alerts on things like earthquakes or volcanoes. Um, you might have civil defense. You might have any number of different types of agencies that are issuing alerts. And they might all, you know, depending on when they were developed, depending on when their infrastructure was established, they might be using different types of media to get those messages out. So they, you know, here are some examples. And in, in a single country, all of the following of these things could be true. You could be receiving different types of emergency information through different mechanisms. You, you shared a lot of mechanisms earlier, and I think many of you shared more than one different type of mechanism that you receive alerts through. So does that mean that you're receiving earthquake information through text messages and you're receiving hydromet information through a weather app? Um, and those things coming from different places means that every individual needs to be kind of able to access all of those different mechanisms in order to get consistent alerts for all of the different hazards that they might be concerned about. So that's a definitely a challenge. We also see this challenge where um, across, you know, and so that kind of leads to this, right? You might have within your city, you have storms are um, being sent, the information on storms is being sent through sirens, radio and television, earthquake is being sent through different ones, tsunami, fire, volcano, but then in another city or another region or another country, they might be sent in a different way. And you can see how this creates this patchwork of alerting. Um, and it can be problematic. You know, for, there are lots of systems that are designed just for particular emergency situations and for particular communications media. This is, this is both potentially wasteful because there are a lot of redundancies, inefficiencies, duplication of efforts, but it can also potentially be dangerous because people may miss out on alerts that they should have gotten. People might get alerts that are not intended for them and people might get confusing messages that might be difficult for them to confirm. So the common alerting protocol, CAP, was invented to address these major challenges, to take alerting beyond this patchwork. So um, what is CAP? <laughs> Recalling the key facts that we discussed in the flood scenario, um, the common alerting protocol is the international standard format to deliver those key facts, to carry those key facts. It's useful for all types of hazards and it can be used across all different types of media. So it's standard message format designed for all hazards and all media that can um, you know, provide information about weather, fires, pandemics, tornadoes, heat waves, earthquakes, and over all types of media. So the internet, radio, telephones, even things like highway signs, sirens, um, and, and internet news feeds. So all of these things can be targeted to the general public, but they can also be shared internally among designated groups. So if, um, you know, a, a certain uh, group of civic um, authorities or responders need access to different types of information, CAP can be used to deliver that as well. So in order, so the, the, the key parts of this are CAP is an international standard designed for global use, and it's designed to make sure that alerting can be consistent across a variety of different hazards and a variety of different media. It was developed over several years, groups of, of um, international working group of more than 130 emergency managers and information technology and telecom experts worked on this. And the work went through a number of different revisions and iterations and, and ultimately um, version 1.0 of CAP was adopted as an international standard in 2004. It's actively maintained and updated. Um, and is endorsed by a number of different international organizations, including ITU and WMO, and of course, IFRC. So here's the philosophy of CAP. 
Um, it works. So I'm going to go through each one of these really briefly, and we'll have an opportunity for Q&A a little bit later, and I'll give some examples uh, in just a moment. So interoperability. As I mentioned, CAP works across many different broadcasting and dissemination channels. Um, completeness. This, this standard format of CAP covers all of the key facts in an emergency. Recalling the flood scenario, each one of those individual key facts, is they're all contained within uh, the CAP message. It has a very simple implementation. It doesn't require huge investments in new infrastructure or technology. It can be in implemented relatively simply. It follows a simple XML format, um, so it can easily integrate into many systems. Um, it also has a multi-use format, so this is referring to the fact that it can be used for all types of hazards and emergencies. Um, CAP alerts can be targeted, so it can target specific geographic areas to make sure that only the people who are potentially impacted by a particular emergency are receiving those alerts. CAP can be contextualized and include actionable messages. So it could be translated into all of, a number of different languages as needed to reach the communities that it needs to reach and can very easily integrate actionable messages such as what now, which we will speak about in the next session. And it's consistent. I think for the, for the public, this is one of the things that's most important. And one of the things that, that I find most valuable about CAP is that using this standard format ensures that emergency alerts go out consistently across all different types of communication and broadcasting channels. And that means that the end users, the people that need to receive that information are getting consistent messaging regardless of where, you know, what mechanism they're, they're seeing it show up on, if it's on social media or on the television, and regardless of what alerting authority is issuing that emergency alert. So um, that's really the, 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 key, the, the, the key most valuable piece of this as far as I see it, is that in an emergency, um, you might have a bunch of different authorities who are, are acting in different ways during that emergency. The scientific and technical agencies, which are trying to determine um, the, the details of that hazard, how, how strong the storm might be, um, how extensive the earthquake might be. Um, and then you have civ civic authorities, which are responsible for you know, making sure that the public is safe. In these emergencies, you might have overlapping uh, jurisdictions, multiple authorities involved in each one, especially if you have overlapping emergencies, as we have all seen within the last couple of years, where we're, you know, we're all dealing with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And on top of that, you know, our, our sort of the hazards that normally impact our area, such as flooding or tsunamis or typhoons, those things have not stopped. So we're dealing with overlapping emergencies. We're dealing with pandemic at the same time we're dealing with a typhoon. Um, so CAP can ensure that all of these trusted authorities can communicate their key facts coherently and that the message are harmonized. Messages are harmonized. So I've mentioned official alerting authorities several times. Um, so just to make sure that it's clear what I mean when I'm saying official alerting authority, it's any organization that's authorized to perform the function of alerting. So a national meteorological or hydrological service emergency management or any other nationally authorized organization. Um, the different countries have their own policies about what it means to be officially authorized, but there is agreement that official alerting authorities need to be known internationally. Um, there's a link here and we can also put it in the chat um, to the register, the official register of alerting authorities that's maintained by WMO. It goes country by country and provides um, information on each of the officially registered alerting authorities. Um, there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna table the conversation about the register for now because I wanna make sure that we can get through this entire presentation, but I'll talk more about the register of alerting authorities in the CAP breakout session. So if you join the CAP breakout session this afternoon or later in this, later in this workshop, I'll, I can go into more detail about the, the register. Great, so now that we have a general idea of what CAP is, let's talk about why it's beneficial. All right, so we've talked about this patchwork of messages. We've talked about the key facts that need to be distributed or the key facts that need to be known in the case of an emergency. 
Um, what CAP can do is supplement or replace those single purpose interfaces between alert sources and the dissemination media. So it creates a common process, a standard format for creating alerts and issuing alerts and facilitates processing of any different kind of alert. Um, this common process means that CAP enabled media can use, that any CAP enabled media platform can use any CAP formatted alert and any CAP formatted alert can be available across all of those different media types. So it's designed for, for every, everyone involved in the emergency and it includes those key facts. So let's look at some specific benefits. CAP makes it quicker and easier to issue alerts. Authorities without CAP alerts issue them in a variety of ways, such as making phone calls, uh, faxes, emails, posting to web pages, social media, um, and, and um, text messages, et cetera. Um, those activities consume a great deal of valuable time. Um, there, there can be delays. They don't necessarily make it to the end, uh, you know, to the community member, to the individual in a timely fashion, because a lot of these rely on the person coming to that media. So the person needs to come to Facebook or come or go check their email or answer that phone call. Um, so um, there are a lot of challenges with all of these different mechanisms. Um, but with CAP, you can post a single message and it can trigger a lot of these different alerting methods. So that means that the same messages can go out through a variety of different mechanisms. Great. Um, so it, CAP provides a shared situational awareness. So it means that um, the sharing of alert information is much easier. There's a lot of inf a lot of different information that has to be assimilated in different scales and alerting is a big part of this. Um, information gathering and analysis is much easier with CAP alerts. The alerting areas are more precise. This is something that some of you brought up earlier where you know you might not be receiving the the alerts that are relevant for your area. Maybe you're getting over alerted because they're the um, dissemination mechanisms are are casting very widely. With CAP, you can target the alerting area much more precisely. That helps to make sure that, that people who are receiving those alerts are um, more trusting of the alerts that they receive because they're only getting alerts that are intended for them um, and they're not missing out on alerts. Um, we can also address some of the other things that you mentioned earlier about language barriers. So with, without CAP, there are a lot of, there's a lot of infrastructure um, that doesn't support accessibility for um, for those who might be cognitively impaired or don't understand the language used in the alerts or may have um, you know that may have different abilities relating to their sight or their hearing there are a lot of barriers there but with cap the mechanisms that, that can be used to distribute the the messages can include automated translation and different media mechanisms that can reach those those more um, difficult to reach populations. <laughs> Um, one of the big things that I saw folks mention in the question earlier was the timeliness of messages. One of the things about CAP that's really wonderful is that alerts can be disseminated very, very quickly because it's a digital message. It's not, he it's not heavy. It doesn't take a long time to distribute through these mechanisms. So those Im that immediate messaging can help to save lives because you're getting them in a timely fashion. All right. I'm going to go through the information that can be included, and then I'll wrap up um, and, and hand it off into the next session. So um, we talked about the key facts. So all of these different things are included in CAP. And some of these I'll definitely go into more detail in the, in the workshop um, or in the breakout session later in the workshop. So if you want to dig into more of the, the content of the CAP messages, we'll have an opportunity to do that later. Um, so the key facts, what is happening it includes a description of the event, what category it falls into, and you can see a list of categories here on the bottom of the slide, whether it's geophysical, meteorological, or something else. And it can include instructions and include, um, it includes a polygon, so an actual drawn um, area of where that hazard is um, intended to, uh, or um, should, will be impacting, and it includes how soon, how bad, and how sure the experts are about this particular hazard. 
And it also gives context to this message. So it includes all these key facts that we talked about before in the flood scenario, but also gives the message context. So who's issuing this alert? Is this, a, you know, is this an official alerting authority? It's, is this coming from the HydroMet office? It tells you when the message was sent um, and when the hazard itself is, um, is uh, anticipated to arrive. Um, and then you can also include additional things in there. You can include other, how it's related to other incidents. Um, and and uh, I'll go into to detail about the rest of these later. I don't wanna go too, too far over on time. All right, so the key elements of, of, of the CAP message are, there's two different types of messages. There are two different types of values in a CAP message. You have text values and you have coded values. The text values are open, field, open fields. So you can put a headline in, you can put a description and you can feel free to, to share pretty detailed information in those uh, free text fields. But then there are also coded values, which helps us to filter and prioritize messages. And that's based on, um, or that includes urgency, severity, and certainty, which addresses some of these key facts that we were talking about earlier, the time frame, the level of threat, and the probability of occurrence. All right, so then finally, dissemination to the public. As I'm bringing up this one more time, so we've discussed who can issue alerts, um, seen examples of the kinds of information included in, in CAP alerts. So let's talk for just a second about how those things reach the public. A standardized format of CAP is this common way of creating and sending alerts so that different agencies alerting about different hazard types can send them in a consistent and reliable way. Similarly, on the receiving end, media agencies and other public and private sector groups who are CAP enabled can receive these alerts and deliver them to the public. Once their system is CAP enabled, they can easily ingest and distribute any and all CAP alerts. So that can include all of these different types of media that we talked about through the internet, smartphones, radio, sirens, um, you know, um, uh, television, uh, all of, and, and radio, all of these different types of dissemination mechanisms. So they can be used to reach then traditional media, um, including the things that you mentioned earlier, television, radio, uh, even landline telephones and faxes um, can also reach all of the different ways that we're used to accessing things on mobile phones and can be, on, and can be put online. So that includes Google public alerts um, and social media. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up because uh, my time is up and I don't want um, to go into the next person's time. This has been a very brief introduction to CAP. <laughs> um, I will stop sharing now and have an opportunity to go into more discussion with this later on, like I said. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Bonnie. Um, Bonnie Haskell, who also works with me at GDPC. Bonnie's going to talk about um, the, the actionable messaging piece of what we're talking about and really talk about how this is, um, um, how this can be relevant for our national societies. So I'll hand it over to Bonnie, thanks. Hey, thanks, Jessica. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, everyone. Um, I'm Bonnie, a Community Preparedness Programs Technical Advisor, long title, at the GDPC, and I support on CAP and specifically on POPE and actionable key messaging or risk communication. And I just wanted to quickly thank Jessica again for a really informative and interesting presentation. And hopefully it answered a lot of your questions, met a lot of expectations already, um, but I'm, I'm assuming you have a lot of good questions and still waiting. So feel free to put them into the chat. And I'm just going to hopefully answer some more questions about actionable key messages in the next 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, so I actually want to start with a bit of a reflection from the group on this past presentation from Jessica. And so I'll see if we can put up the mentee. Eddie might be able to help with that. Thank you very much. Just in a moment. Okay. Okay. All right, what we'll actually be reflecting on is what you think, so you can get started thinking before the mentee comes up, um, about what you think the unique role is of the Red Cross, Red Crescent, National Society, you on um, for emergency alerting and government alerting in, in country. 
So feel free to get back into Menti. I'm really looking forward to what you think about the unique role of the Red Cross and Red Crescent in government alerting. So we'll leave a few minutes for that. I know it takes some time to think about it. Actionable messaging, great. Perfect, actual messaging, use the Red Cross network to spread the message. Yes, alerting people without phone service, absolutely. Trusted source of information, yes, yes. Absolutely, working closely with the government, cooperation, amplifying the alerts. I see in the chat, timely messaging, definitely. Sorry. That's all right. Yes, community level, absolutely. I see reliable come up a lot, very reflective of, of our network. Contextual, context-based alerting, great. Raising community awareness, definitely. And yes, helping people, helping the alerting authorities work together, really a convener. Independence, it's a good point. All hazards approach, absolutely. Wide volunteer network, collaboration, knowing the most vulnerable, I think that's a really important point. Talked about that in my breakout room as well. Great. Well, thank you for all this. Feel free to continue to put your responses in the chat. And um, this is a really great way to segue into what we wanted to talk about because I can see actionable key messaging came up. A lot of other interesting things came up about being a convener, working together with alerting authorities, bringing them together, cooperation, also about being a reliable source of information. This is all, these are all things we're gonna talk about today. And some of them relate to what we're gonna talk about now, which is actionable messaging. So I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Yes, we actual do. Messages. Great, thank you, Eddie. Um, so yes, we'll be talking about actual messaging and specifically about Pape. And first I wanted to address a challenge that has come up a lot and Jessica alluded to this as well, that emergency alerts often are sent without actual messaging. And this can be really dangerous because let's imagine the scenario Jessica talked about that an alert goes out for a flood, there's a flood warning. People are receiving that message. They might know where it is. They know that they're in harm's way. Um, they know when it's going to occur and it's happening imminently. But if they don't know what to do, there's no messaging there telling them how to safely prepare, how to safely respond, then it can be really dangerous for them. They might be confused. They might be really scared. So it's very, very important to think about the actual messaging. Um, I also saw that sometimes it came up uh, a challenge for you all is that the messaging that is included, if it is included, is really technical. Um, and that might be because alerting authorities or the technical experts don't have the awareness or the community level connection to know how to communicate effectively about the risk, how to prepare, how to safely respond. So that's another challenge is that if there is actual messaging, which there isn't always, but if there is, it might be too technical for the community to understand. Another challenge actually is that if emergency alerts are not sent without actionable messaging, sometimes media adds in their own actionable messaging. We've seen when talking to a lot of our colleagues um, across the network is that they've seen media add in their own messaging that they're taking just from the internet or what they think people should do. And so this is different across media channels. So someone might receive in a radio program, different messaging on how to act than they would see on the TV, or they might receive in a WhatsApp group. And that can be really confusing to someone. Um, they don't know what to trust. It's not consistent. They don't know what to do. So in the end, the big challenge is we need to address this, this situation so people know what to do. They know how to safely act. And this is where you come in, as you know. We have, you have the expertise. You have the expertise in disaster preparedness, disaster management, early warning, early action, and you have the trust of the communities um, 
to know what are the actual messaging, how to effectively communicate that, um, and how to make sure that alerting authorities know about these actionable messages and can include it in their alerts. And this brings me to a question. Um, you probably received this when you were registering for the event, so I might know the answer, but do any of you know what Pop A is? And actually, I'm just going to exit out of presentation mode, um, go over to Zoom. Oh, I don't know how actually, but if you could put a little reaction on Zoom, if you know about Pop A, if you know what it stands for, um, if you know how it works, if you've used it before, that would be really great. Use any reaction. I like the celebratory one because we're really excited about Pop Day. Um, so I'm just going to scroll down. If you could put a reaction, that would be great. If well, not, a couple of thumbs up. Great. Which have just went down. Okay. So it sounds like a few of you know what Pop A is. Um, so I was going to ask if anyone has an example of how to use it, but I might just move along and talk about it a little bit. And then if you do have an example of how you've used Pop A or what you think it is, feel free to put in the chat. We're monitoring the chat. Um, and I'd like to hear what you have to say about it. But just to talk about it a little bit more, if you're wondering what it is, Pop A stands for Public Awareness and Public Education for Disaster Risk Reduction Key Messages. So what this is, is that it's an IFRC and Save the Children key resource of actionable and contextualized messages on how individuals and households can prepare for and respond to local hazards. And within this, this resource is that it's made available to you as a national society to work together with your partners, like your governmental partners or other organizations, other hazard experts, you work together to adapt these key messages to your context so that the messages can be available for your programming, your traditional programming, but can be made available for governments to pair the messaging with their alerts. And you might be wondering, um, how did Pop A come to be? What is it exactly? Can you have a bit more detail? And I'm glad you asked because I'll share some fast facts about Pop A. Um, Pop A was pulled together a few years back by IFRC and Save the Children, but in partnership with UNESCO, UNICEF, um, Plan International, a lot of experts in the field of disaster preparedness and hazard mes messaging and worked with a lot of hazard specific experts at universities, came together, put together globally applicable messaging for 20 hazards, came together and they had a consensus around what the global messages should be. They make this available in Pape and then they have guidance on how national societies and partners can adapt those global messages to your context. Um, we have this in 20 hazards. It's all evidence-based and we have the guidance on how to hold a workshop or how to contextualize it on your own and send it to the government um, to, to sign off on it, to make sure you're in a consensus about it. And then, um, then you can make it available in a library of the What Now service, which I'm going to get to now. But you're wondering maybe how do you adapt these messages? And how it works is that you can adapt them on your own. You might already have key messaging. A lot of you probably do have your own key messaging on how people can prepare for and respond to or recover from local hazards. If you do, you can compare it to the Pop A resource. Maybe you'll learn a lot from the resource on how to further enhance your messaging so it can reach the community. Um, and then you can send it to your governmental partners. You can present it to the government. Say, hey, we have these Pop A messages. Um, we know the community and it can be an advocacy piece so they can learn that they can work together with you on how to send out alerts, make sure they're cap alerts and they have the messaging attached. So what happens is after you adapt the messaging, you upload them on a global site that we have called the What Now service. Um, and this is just a, a website where you host your messages and it's a library of your messages. But once they're there, that means alerting authorities can automatically pull them and include them in their CAP alerts. So again, this is an advocacy piece saying, if you use CAP, you can automatically pull our messages, our Pop Bay messages or what now safety tips is also how we call them. You can pull these messages, broadcast them with a CAP alert, and then it automatically goes out to all of these communication channels in a very consistent way with evidence-based trusted messaging. These messages can also be sent with your national society name and logo. Um, so that when community members receive the alert, 
they get the really technical, the scientific facts about um, where it's happening, what it is, and uh, who's sending it. They get that attributed to the alerting authority, but then those preparedness messages, the actionable messages, PAPE, what now messages are attributed to you. So then the community member sees this and they know, oh, okay, I know I can trust this. I know my Red Cross and Red Crescent. I know that I can trust what they're saying. I'm getting the same message across so many communication channels. I know what to do. And so just to show a slide that Jessica had showed before about the content, you can see that what, where, who says it, when, uh, the relations, these are parts of the message content that are really covered by the alerting authority. Um, but this what to do, this instruction piece are your pop A key messages or what now safety tips is another way we call them. And they're made available. I want to stress this. Once you upload it on the site, they're made available automatically for the government to pull them put them in a cap alert. So this is really great. If you adapt these messages using Pape, you adapt them with the government. So then they're on board with the messaging and then they know, oh, okay, if I use cap, these messages will be in it. People will trust the messages. They'll know what to do. Um, and I think this hopefully answers a lot of your questions about, and a lot of your points about how we're a reliable source of information. We're trusted in the community. We know the community. We can link it with the national level early warning system. And we can do that through presenting Pape and the what now safety tips. And so just quickly why it matters, and then I'll open up the Q&A about what I presented and what Jessica presented. As I mentioned, it's a partnership building advocacy piece. Um, it's a way to be a convener, bring together the government, other organizations, your own internal departments to have consensus and harmonize standardized messaging. Um, you have the trust behind it because it has your name behind it. You have the evidence base and it's consistent. There's the consistency in messaging that's going out um, across communication channels. Again, it's also hosted on the What Now service platform, the website, so it's a message library. I talked about in my breakout room, um, I heard that often there's the challenge of getting messages out in traditional means, not just in um, technical, technological means. And so if this is hosted in a library, which it will be, you can print it out and volunteers can go out and spread the same messages in traditional means, face-to-face, uh, -face, household to household, um, that is that they're hearing on the TV as well and radio. So they're getting the same message over and over again. And then hopefully what we're aiming for is that community members know how to safely act. And that is what I have to share today about actionable messaging, risk communication, really an overview. But as Jessica mentioned, we're having later on some working sessions and breakout groups. So I'm very happy to walk you through the adaptation process, talk a little bit more about Pape and answer questions there. Um, but right now we're going to also open it up to more questions you might have about CAP or about Pape. We might have some in the chat and feel free to raise your hand or just to unmute yourself and ask some questions. So thank you. Opening up now to Q&A. And just to flag for both of you, there was one question in the chat from um, Carmel already for Jessica on how CAP can reach heart, um, how CAP, how can CAP reach heart to reach areas or those without signals in their community? Maybe we can get started with that one and then. Sure, sure. Coming. So, um, so it's important to, to not think of CAP as the actual sort of um, signal um, that's being sent. But CAP is the format that can be sent um, through a variety of different types of signals. Um, so the, the way that CAP makes it easier to reach the, the, those hard to reach communities or places that don't have cell signal, for example, is because um, CAP enabled messages can be distributed through so many different mechanisms that you can, the, the two things. One, you can have redundancy. So you can send messages out through through cell service, um, through any kind of other, um, you know, internet-based mechanism, but you can also utilize CAP through things like television and radio and things that are um, more commonly reaching um, those hard to reach communities. And that can even include things like sirens. So um, it's really that, that standardization that allows for redundancy and um, is easily distributed through a variety of different mechanisms that makes it um, easier to reach people who need that message.
If there are any other questions, you can either raise your hand or put them in the chat. We have a couple of minutes available for questions before the next session. Yeah, you have one more, you have one there. I see, okay. So the question is, um, do we or does CAP actually send the messages on different media or does it depend on everyone taking on the CAP format on the usual channels? Um, so that's a that's a great question. Um, it it's it's up to it's up to the media. Um, so it's up to the media partner, like the television, um, uh, the, the the TV company or the the radio stations or the smartphone application developers. It's up to them to um, to integrate that CAP um, alerting mechanism like into their existing system. But it doesn't take a lot of um, it doesn't take a lot of investment, and some of that can be done, um, you know, relatively low tech. Um, so you can, um, on the radio, for example, you can do it a number of different ways. Um, you can have a cap message that comes in, um, and have the the person on the radio, like the actual radio announcer, can just read the message and broadcast it verbally um, to the audience, or you can set it up so that there's an automated way for the, the cat message to sort of break into the programming on the radio and read that message out loud. But it is up to that media partner um, to help with the dissemination. And so that's one, one of the reasons why one of the focuses of this workshop today is on partnerships and developing those partnerships, not only with the alerting agencies, but with our media partners. So we will have an opportunity to, to talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica and Bonnie. I am here also wondering how long does all does all, does all this take? The contextualization is there an approximation or? Contextualization of the messages is that what you mean? Yes. Yes, that can be um, very situational. Um, from our experience, uh, a lot of national societies already have key messaging that they're using um, across different programming. And so it would just be a situation where they compare it to PAPE and see if they want to enhance their messaging or adapt it further. Um, and then they would present it as sort of an advocacy piece to the government so that the government can adapt it more or further with them or sign off on it. And then they would upload it on the site. It can be very simple. Sometimes at a national society, you might be new to having key messaging, actionable messaging. So you would just quickly look over PAPE. We can support in this. You can host a workshop with partners on how to contextualize it. And that's about a two day workshop. Or you can contextualize it internally with internal departments like the comms team, your disaster management team, come together and contextualize it. And then again, present it to the government. So it can be however long it takes for your national society, depending on where you are in the process of having key messages. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Our participants, uh, please, you have an excellent opportunity to ask some questions in the plenary right now, and we would like you to take it up. Um, both you can unmute or you could type it as um, Camille has done before. Okay, I suspect people are typing their messages or formulating them, I mean the questions. So we'll give them one more minute and then we can also give them more time uh, to ask later during the forecast in-depth discussion. Sounds good. Oh, there, there you go. I told you we can wait. One was coming. 
Okay. That's that's really helpful. Thanks. That's like this is a great question. So, is CAP an application, or can it just be, or is, or basically, is it a standardized text? So, I'm I'm sorry if I wasn't quite clear on that. So, CAP is a standard format. Um, so it's essentially, it's essentially a way of presenting the information um, that that allows for the, all of these different fields to be filled out that 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 completely include all of the different um, all of the different elements of that alert message. So CAP itself is the standard format. It's not an it's not an app. It's not um, you know something like that. It's it's a format that can be used to put in all of the message components in a standardized fashion so that it can be easily distributed and easily um, you know, sent out and received. And we can share some examples. I can either share them in the chat. Um, we can, well, you we can share some examples. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Um, I can hear someone probably would like to voice their question. But I think in the interest of time, 